Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week on this show, I invite a girlfriend to join me and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Calling all Texas moms. Urgent Care for Kids is a pediatric specialized urgent care with 10 locations across the greater Austin, Houston, and Dallas-Fort Worth areas, as well as home telemedicine for kids. Now you can access quality pediatric specialized care on your iPhone or computer within minutes. Urgent Care for Kids truly has the child and their family at the forefront. And just in time for summer camp and Little League, they are offering our listeners a $20 discount on sports physicals in any urgent care for kids location. When you mention the happy hour or use discount code UCK20OFF, that's all one word. You guys, I got to get lots of physicals next year. This is great. Visit UrgentCareKids.com to learn more or contact a location near you. Guys, you're listening to episode number 192, and my guest today is Mo Isom. Mo is the author of Wreck My Life, and her newest book, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot, which released a couple months ago. She's widely recognized as a powerful female voice rising up for her generation as her unique personal story and athletic endeavors have provided her with a platform to challenge, encourage, and equip others to live boldly despite their circumstances. You are going to believe what I just said about her after listening to today's show. On today's show, guys, we talk a lot about sex and pornography, since that is what her latest book is about. So with that being said, this show might not be suitable for young ears. Mamas, go ahead and listen first, and then you can make the call if you want your teenage daughter to listen. I love most passion on this topic, and I know that you're going to love our conversation. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Find us both over on Twitter and let us know. I am at Jamie underscore Ivy. And Mo is at Mo Isom. You guys, this past weekend was the Happy Hour Live, and it was more than we could have ever imagined. It was so fabulous. I feel like I just had the best weekend ever. My guests on stage were lovely. The food was great. Well, I assume that because I never even actually ate any. The room and the venue were gorgeous. And to all of you that joined us, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you had such a fabulous time as well. Guys, if you want to know what these Happy Hour Live events are like, just go check out my Instagram at Jamie Ivy because I posted some pictures. I'm about to post some blogs about it. It's just so much fun. And women come in from all over the country and we have the best girls night ever. We're super close to announcing our next dates for this event, which are in October. I can tell you that you're going to want to get on this ticket. The next one will sell out because we don't have an unlimited number of tickets to sell like we did this last time. The way to be in the know is through my newsletter. You can subscribe by going to jamieivy.com slash newsletter. Every week, we send out the show notes and a few other times a month, some thoughts from me. Okay, friends, here is my conversation with Mo Isom. Mo, welcome to the happy hour. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And look at you all the way in Austin from Atlanta. I know. This feels wild and crazy. Do you feel like you had a vacation today? Listen to this. Never in my life have I gotten on a plane and gone somewhere (laughs) and then I'll get back on the plane and get home tonight in a day. I feel so wild and crazy and spontaneous. And I told my daughter last night, baby, tomorrow mommy's got to go to Texas. And she was like, oh, okay. When when you come home. And I was like, also tomorrow. (laughs) How does that sound? Coolest day ever. (laughs) And she was like, oh, okay. She didn't care. But for me, I felt like a spontaneous jet setter. And this is very exciting. And I went to the trendiest little coffee shop. Cafe No Say. Hipster, Cafe No Say. Hipsters all around me. And I thought, this is it. Can you tell them? Do you care? I'm not one to throw you under the I bus here. I don't care at all. Can you tell them what you were doing with the hipsters sitting around you? Whipped out a boob. I was, <laughs> I was, I was pumping discreetly. Is it manual or? Uh, it was a manual. Okay. So there was no hiding mm-hmm. my like <laughs> forearms <laughs> action and just several around me who I knew were, were uncomfortable by the situation. But hey, you know what? Babies, Mama's got to do what They were made to feed to babies. And when you're out of town... You got to deal with what you got to deal with. Exactly. We make it work. We make it Every work. Every time I travel, I we make it work. I don't love pumping. I don't think any woman would say like pumping is my favorite, but you have to do it. it. Mm-hmm. And I asked you immediately when you told me that, did you have to throw it away? That's what every woman's list wondering right now. And no, you're prepared. Nope. Nope. I have a tiny cooler um, with an ice pack. I love <laughs> and it. I just bring it with me on trips and the TSA agent has to check it every time and... 
So I before just, you go through, you say, FYI, I say, milk. guys, I've got breast milk in here. <laughs> and some will get so uncomfortable. They'll be like, we don't need to check. It's all good. <laughs> some want to open every bag and sample and run it through. I'm like, guys, I'm not smuggling like bomb material in, in the this, breast milk, in this lactation. <laughs> I just am trying to get home to my I'm just kids. trying to feed my babies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh. So it's hit or miss, but we make it. We bring the cooler every time. I love it. I'm glad you're in Austin. I'm so Me glad too. we get to sa- sit down together. Uh, you have your second book out. It's called Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot. And yes. I'll tell you what, Mo, when I got this book in the mail a couple months ago, I opened it up and like you, I'm sure, because it's a podcast, I get a lot of books in the mail. Mm-hmm. You can see my stack to your right. <laughs> I get a lot of books in the mail. Wow. Um, and a lot of books, if I don't end up using them and doing something, I actually take them to the jail. So that they all go to good oh, use. Nice. There's yes. that, yeah. Um, but I got this book and I thought to myself, I'm either going to love this book or hate it. Yeah. I did not know what to expect, but I did know this. If I love it, I'm going to love it. Mm-hmm. And if I hate it, I just give it to Goodwill or something. But yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you. It's still in your lap. So it didn't go to Goodwill. It's so a that's love. That's a good thing. Yay. It's a love. And I'm so, so glad. Um, I, I dove into the book and I'm telling you, I thought to myself, I want to meet Mo because... We have some of the same passions, yeah. Some of the same history, some yeah. of the same desires for women, um, and so just start here. Let's start at the very beginning when you decided I'm going to write a book, and we'll go back and how you got here. But when you decided sure. I want to write a book about sex, mm-hmm. is that was that your first thought? You know, my first thought, um, my first book, wreck my life. I wrote, it is my testimony of coming to faith. So it is my, you know, backstory, coming to Jesus and what life looked like after that. Um, Which side note, I want to read now because you reference a very traumatic event in this book, which I'm assuming you talk about more in the other book. And so it made me go, Amazon, here I come, wreck my life. Yeah, it's, I mean, it moves through so much of my life involved so much adversity. So identity issues and eating disorder, very unexpected suicide of my dad, um, a horrific car accident. It was just storm after storm after storm. Um, But Jesus intersected my story and changed everything. And so as I was writing that book, I knew there was such a sexual testimony that aligned, you know, that was just parallel to all of that, all happening at the same time. But I, I, couldn't sell it short. I couldn't like condense it and pack it in to, to like one chapter. One. Yeah. Right. It would have, the conversation is too rich. There's too much to unpack there. And there's too much that so many women in this world are wrestling with that I just couldn't squeeze it in. I knew it needed to breathe and I knew it needed legs of its own. So I, um, when I wrote Wreck My Life, actually still, I was still in the writing process when I was like, it's got, the second book has to be about sex. I just, it had has to be unpacked. And it was then in 2015, I was like standing in my kitchen, um, still in the editing process of the first one, where it was literally just like, like a download from God. It's sex, Jesus, and the conversations the church forgot. He gave me the title. He gave me every topic he wanted to address. I couldn't write it down fast enough. I'm like grabbing scratch paper. Um, and I sprint up to my mom because we were newlyweds and we were living um, on like the lower level of my mom's house at that time. And I'm like, this is my next greatest blog series. And she's like, okay. And then I was like, it's not a blog. It's more, it's a book. And I was just so, I was excited at that point to dive into what should be like scary or taboo. I wasn't. If God says speak, it's like it lit a fire. And so I always knew this would be its own its own deal and was surprisingly not as scared to write it as I, was, I think. I was going to say, you said scary and taboo. I mean, it is, mm-hmm. it is putting yourself out there to say, yeah, I'm going to say all these things. And ha- you just answered my question. Has it hasn't been as scary as you thought it was going to be? You know, <laughs> It just, it was proven too true what scripture says, that sin is defeated by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies. There's so much power in our stories. And I saw that so much the first time around that it eased the fear or the anxiousness or the worry of laying this stuff out there too. You know, when we find the courage to share our testimonies, not only does it, 
you know, allow us to vocalize and get the story out there, but it knocks the knees out from under the enemy using it against you or, you know, silencing you into shame anymore. And so um, it wasn't as scary as I thought. Now there was one portion in in here um, that I actually had never told anyone except my husband and my best friend. Which, what, what um, was it? About being involved in an adulterous I relationship. I just read that today. Yep. Yeah, being um, involved with unknowingly with a married man because um, I was drunk in college and could have. You cared had less told your husband that. I had. Yep. And did yeah. you when you thought I'm going to write this? Did you go to Jeremiah? That's Jeremiah, right? Did yep. you go to him and say, "What do you think about me putting this in there?" Or did I, you just do it? Not not in, in a weird way, but did right. you get counsel on that, or what did you feel like? I did. So the chapter is um, in the myth of darkness, and I'm sitting here unpacking like how we pervert privacy and how we keep things, you know, we claim it's just our right to privacy, but we're actually just kind of stuffing everything into truly dark places. And I'm sitting there like wrestling with God, like what, you know, narrative element do I give this? What do I talk about? And God's like, you know exactly mm. what you need to talk about. And you're about. like, no, not, I'm like, no. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't actually, yeah. Lord. <laughs> oh, You're like playing um, that dumb card of, I don't know yeah. what to do here. Trying to think of anything other than that that I could have expounded on. But that moment, waking up in my bed in college and replaying the night before in my mind and realizing, am I an adulteress? Mm. It shifted things tremendously. It was a big wake-up call to me through the course of my story. And so... Ugh, I didn't want to put it in there. Lord, I was so scared what my mom would think and she's yet to mention it. <laughs> I have but a whole chapter I, uh, in my book, my parents and I have yet to talk about. So. <laughs> Maybe we never will. But um, my husband was sitting on the couch as I was like at the dining room table writing. And he, of course, mm -hmm. knew that part of my story. Mm -hmm. But I went in there and I was like, babe, I think I have to write this. And I don't know what this will look like or how this will be received. And he is, he's so similar to Aaron. He's just my greatest, like, cheerleader and just champions it forward. And he wasn't ashamed. He mm. wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't afraid what people would think. And so, you know, if my groom's not afraid, then what do I have to fear? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if God's not afraid for that to be shared, God says, boast in your weaknesses. So you can point to the glory of the cross. So if I can find the courage to share about one of the most humiliating things, it makes the grace that redeemed it that much sweeter. And so... Ugh, bit the bullet, wrote it out. My, I got a, an email from my husband's grandma the other day about how she had read. And I was sitting there thinking, well, Marilyn, <laughs> what'd you think of chapter? What is it? Six, seven, nine? I don't know. So that part was scary. But honestly, talking about pornography, talking about promiscuity, talking about these other elements, they just weren't as fearful for me as I assumed they yeah. would be. And I think it's because so much of this book too is rooted in the truth about sex as well, what God designed it for, the fact that it's an act of worship, the fact that he redeems it so beautifully, the fact that, you know, all of these glorious things that we forget to talk about, because it all comes back to Jesus, because it all comes back to God's design, because it all comes back to redemption. Like I said, it makes boasting in the, yeah. the messy yeah. stuff easier. I want to hear a little bit of your story, and you write about this in the book, but I want to hear a little bit about just the journey um, of you and Becoming a Christian mm -hmm. um, and then realizing this is an area that I'm going to have to change. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to relate to this. I relate to it. I remember having to change and going, I don't know how to date as a Christian. Yeah. I know. Right. Um, and so I want to hear you talk about your year. What do you call it? No kissing till the next Christmas. Kissless till next Christmas. <laughs> Kissless till next Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Um, you really felt God ask you to do a really big challenge, and that is to not date. To, it wasn't even like don't have sex for a year. It was right. you've got no eyes for anyone else. You've got no attention for anyone else. There's no flirting. There's no nothing. Yeah. For an entire year. And, um, I understand the weight of that and yeah. how big of, a, of an ass that was of God for you. Right. Tell me about that year. It was, it felt like an even bigger ask from God because it was prime time. I was in college. I was like a young what, woman. How old were you? Um, I was 19. Okay. Yes, I was 19. And so you, you played college soccer all four mm -hmm. years? Yes. Okay, so when did your, just give me just some reference here, your car wreck? 
Yes. Was, how old were you? That was after my sophomore year of college. So I was 19. 19. Yes. Yes. Okay. This was immediately after that, okay. that God called me into this intimacy fast. And because I don't know your story, did you grow up in a Christian home? I did. Okay. So you like, yeah. I know all about God. Yep. Girl, we are yeah. so similar. Okay. This is fun. Um, yeah. Grew up in a Christian home with with wonderful parents who work to instill what that truly meant in me. But I was just young mm -hmm. and stubborn and naive. And really it was more of this faith by inheritance, this sort of my parents are Christians, so I'm a Christian. I could have told you a lot about God, but I didn't know mm -hmm. God intimately. And so that just led to a lot of identity issues that led to me trying to fill holes sexually that led to eating disorders, that led to grief, that led to depression, that led to all of these things when we stand on the sand instead of the rock. And so I had had such this messy sexual testimony, this m messy sexual backstory of just misguidance and misbehavior, kind of flying this banner of virginity, but running every base I could, like pushing the envelope as far as mm -hmm. I could, but still claiming I was a virgin, just seeking worth and affirmation from me. And it was just so tiresome. It was just so messy. And so- Isn't it funny real quick how hard that is to keep up? Oh man, I relate so much to the woman at the well who's come back for bucket yes. after bucket after bucket. How tiring must that yes. journey have been? Every time we're coming back and again and again, it's just never satisfying. I literally look back and I'm like, how did I handle the drama? It yes. was just- constant. And then it's the different guy and maybe he'll make me feel, you know, the way I need to feel. Let me give him a piece of my body and hopes he'll give me his heart. It was just messy. Mm -hmm. It's like the best word I can yeah. use to describe yeah. it. And so exhausting. And um, so when I came to know Christ, when God literally just interrupted my life, there was this immediate and very newfound revelation in my heart that he called us to love him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. What does all mean? Like, because I knew that scripture, mm -hmm, for love sure. the Lord your God. I, think, uh -huh. no, I knew that when I was churched. But what did it mean in light of the cross when all suddenly begins to carry a very heavy weight? And what God really pressed on my heart right after just intersecting my story was, love me with all of you right now and, and watch what I will do. And so he called me into this intimacy fast where it was really just to put on the blinders, set your eyes on me with all of your sight, you know, put on the blinders to everything that's been distracting you and exhausting you and frustrating you and walk with me as if you were in a committed monogamous relationship with me. Don't flirt with anybody. Don't hold hands. Don't tease. Don't, you know, physically involve nothing. Carry yourself like you would carry yourself if you were in a committed monogamous relationship with someone else. And so I... Um, Did you tell anyone about this idea? I started blogging about it. Okay. At the same time, God was saying, oh, and by the way, tell everyone everything. And you're like, in college. I'm in college. And I've, you know... I've got a reputation. I've got a, I've been in college running how I was running and suddenly Christ intersects my life after my sophomore year and just, it's like pumps the brakes. And now he's not only like step into this journey mm -hmm. and walk with tell me fully, people. but tell everyone uh -huh. everything. And I'm like, but I don't know all the answers yet. How can I tell everybody everything? I'm, I'm messy. And he's like, no, you're redeemed. Mm. Now hold my hand walk with me, step into this season of isolation, really, with Jesus. That's a word we're like scared of. Loneliness, mm -hmm. we're scared of. Like separation, we're scared of. But because we're scared of these words, we continue to live in the rhythm of sin. Mm -hmm. And we think that's a little more comfortable. Because it but seems like, like what we know. Exactly. Yeah. And what we know, we're, we're, it might be messy and exhausting, it's but we're like us. used uh -huh. to making the trek yep. back and forth to the well. Yep. So we know that path. He's like, no. Rip, come on, mm -hmm. rip away. And so he called me into an intimacy fast there, really, I think, so he could just reset my heart and pull away the clutter and put on the blinders and just give all of myself to him 
and see what he would do. And so um, it was hard. I lost friends. I, I was going to say I lost acquaintances. Well, I was going to say, because all of a sudden this is a new mo. Well, when you don't want to serve the sin in someone else anymore and they still want to live in that, they're quick to find somebody else That's who will true. be by their side. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. um, sin, sin likes company. Um, but if, you know, if grace is calling you to more, it's like yeah. you'll lose some friends. And I really, it was interesting because I moved into kind of this, I like got, got my own place. I even needed to like live alone because it was just a lot. And I got my apartment and... um Honestly, it was kind of lonely. I got a puppy. <laughs> so I was like, I need something to snuggle with. But it was amazing because it gave me this undistracted time with God. And it's so beautiful because he's so faithful and loves us so deeply. He began to then bring true friendship alongside mm-hmm. me of people who were focused on the same things. Yeah. Yes, I lost a lot of friends. Yes, people had a lot to say. Yes, people made fun of me. Yes, I'm sharing this story. You know, I started this like totally rudimentary blog and I'm sharing sort of the backstory and the testimony and it was well received by some, it was scoffed at by others, sure. you know, mm-hmm. but it didn't matter. Yeah, It didn't matter. Uh-huh. Suddenly I was very sure of who I was mm-hmm. and what I was doing. Yeah. Then he began to sort of gird up love and support yeah. alongside me and I made friends that I still have to this day. Yeah. One thing I really appreciated and going along talking about this same story that you're talking about here of this year of just complete utter. It became two years. It yes, was so it did amazing. become two years. I remember <laughs> reading that. One thing I really um, appreciated about that is you talked about after your two years, you, we won't tell the whole story, but you meet your now husband mm-hmm. and you guys date and everything. One thing I really appreciated was you still talking about how, although God had done so much work in your life, mm-hmm. that sin struggle was still a struggle. Yeah. And I think that that is what some people can be naive about. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe parents can be naive that their kids might struggle with that. We'll use that. And even sometimes ourselves, when God yeah. does a big work in our life for us to think, oh, that will never be an issue anymore. And praise God, sometimes that is true, right? right. I mean, I have right. plenty of friends who this is gone, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I appreciated your willingness and openness to talk about, hey, I had to learn how to fight this still. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about that when you and your husband started dating, just about how you had to learn. You had never dated with boundaries. Exactly. You had never dated like this. Exactly. And I think that is what we need to talk about to encourage girls who think, I don't know how to do this. It's hard. It is so hard because, you know, I came out of this basically two year intimacy fast semi self-righteous and like, look what I can do. God has taught me so much. I've grown so much. I've learned so much. I'm feel healed. I feel whole, you know, all of the amazing things that are true. Sure. But man, sin is vicious and the world is tough to navigate. And, you know, I met Jeremiah smoking hot first and foremost. I mean, he's just, I love that you say that about your man. Come on. Oh, God is so faithful. He does this. <laughs> so good looking. Um, no, but I met him and, and he was a believer as well. Very much filled with the Holy Spirit, loved Jesus, had had grown up um, in the same things. And and so we're both a little self-righteous and we know, we know how to, do, we'll date now, you know, so led in such a godly capacity. And um, then sin enters in and temptation enters in. And um, when we haven't established boundaries, when we haven't had conversations to lead out, you know, when we just assume oh, I'm ready, I'm equipped, I'm strong enough, but we never wrestle it up and line things out and, you know, prayerfully move forward. Um, We can just fall right back into a lot of some of the same struggles. And so um, for us, we, I think, just kind of self-righteously thought this won't be a struggle for us. We've got this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly, again, in the face of temptation, Mm -hmm. we chose to choose for ourselves. Too smoking <laughs> hot. Gosh, what I looked like back then. I look back to like swimsuit pics then and I'm like, oh, work it, girl. Mama, <laughs> work it. What happened? Oh, whatever. Um, no, but it's, it was, you know, uh, uh, suddenly temptation was very real again. Mm-hmm. And how quickly we choose what's best for us yeah. again or what yeah. we want or mm-hmm. what we need. And scripture, what like, our flesh speaks, is craving. Yeah. Exactly. What our flesh wants. And, 
And what's so very different when you then are, are walking with Jesus is you feel conviction very quickly. It's almost easier pre-Jesus mm-hmm. to kind of live in sexual oh, for sure sin. It is. We deal with the emotional struggle, the physical repercussions. And there might like, be guilt of getting caught or guilt of cheating on your boy, whatever. Yeah. The the very just, I guess, handleable stuff. Mm-hmm. But suddenly when when we know Jesus, man, there's a very real awareness of sin and a conviction that follows it and a weight to the fact that we're talking a talk, but not walking yeah. the walk behind mm-hmm. closed doors. And it, we just started on this roller coaster. And, and I'm also starting out ministry mm-hmm. at this time. And that's something I feel like we aren't talking about. A lot of people in ministry are struggling with very real sin struggles, and it seems too shameful to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I think, sometimes why we stay silent on important conversations, because we're kind of silenced by our own shame. Yeah. But we just started on this roller coaster ride of sin and then conviction and repentance together and then sin again. We're going to do better. And, and we yeah. last a little longer. And, you know, and sexual sin is a death sentence to a healthy relationship. Mm. And it's a death sentence to ministry because it's a death sentence often to your peace and your fullness of walking in obedience to the Father. And it was just really hard. And so we came to this reckoning point of, okay, we can't ride this roller coaster anymore. We've got to decide what what are our options here? What does scripture actually say about this? And this is what I would encourage anyone listening who's maybe on this roller coaster too right now. Look to the word, weigh things against the word. And what does it say? Well, scripture gives us two options. What I could find, if someone else can find a third or fourth or fifth option, amazing, let me know. But What I found was that scripture gives us, you know, two options in light of sexual sin when we know the truth. Um, Flee or marry. Flee from sexual sin. Flee. Flee like your life and your heart and your soul's vitality depends on it. Take off and run. Sever the relationship. Guard your heart. Flee from it. Or Paul says, rather than burn in lust, marry, Mm -hmm. you know, and those are big decisions. Those are huge Those decisions. Are huge decisions. But sitting in the middle ground, nothing's ever served in no man's land. Like, just like the lukewarm mm-hmm. walk will never satisfy, we'll continue to ride the roller coaster if we live in this no man's land of like, oh, but I don't want to break up. Right. Oh, but we're too young to marry. Or, oh, but we're not ready to marry. Oh, but I love him. And oh, but don't. well, ugh, dig into the book if you want that unpacked further. But Man, scripture gives us two choices, Mm -hmm. flee or marry. And so um, Jeremiah and I obviously opted for the second after much prayer and after um, really navigating what that would look like. And it's been the best decision of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say we stood at the altar and it was just this rigid decision of like, well, well, we got to get married we so we won't keep going around. around. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, truly, we love each other. There were such foundations mm-hmm. there that were so solid. Yeah. I mean, it was a very... Um, well-rounded choice but if it hadn't been i would have you're ready to flee i was ready to flee okay friends i know that you're loving mo when she came to my office to chat we could have chatted for hours upon hours and upon hours i loved having her in my studio so i know you're loving it but first let me thank our sponsors because that is what makes the happy hour possible Support for today's show comes from Third Love. Armed with the measurements of millions of women, Third Love bras are designed to fit real women. You and me, guys, real women. I have people all the time ask me, hey, you talk about Third Love. Do you actually wear their bras? And I'm here to tell you, almost every single one of my bras are Third Love. They sent me one for free to try it out, and then I just kept buying because I love them. They fit so well. Here's what I love about it as well, is there's no more awkward fitting room experiences. With their Fit Finder quiz, 3rd Love helps you identify your breast shape and find styles that fit your body in less than a minute. All you have to do, guys, is just answer a few simple questions. And they have 60 sizes ranging from AA through G, including, get this, you guys, half cup sizing. That is genius. 3rd Love guarantees a perfect fit. And 3rd Love values comfort and quality with straps that won't slip, ultra soft smoothing fabrics, and lightweight memory foam cups. The labels, you guys, they're even tagless, so there's not any itchy stuff going on in your back. Plus, returns and exchanges are always free and easy. 
Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they are offering my listeners, that's you because you're listening, 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash Jamie now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. Guys, it's almost summer. You need a new bra. Go to thirdlove.com slash Jamie for 15% off today. Okay, I also want to thank SAS Footwear. Are you frustrated with the shoes in your closet that make your feet hurt all day long? At SAS Footwear, they understand how difficult it is to find stylish shoes that are comfortable. That's why for over 40 years, they've been making, fitting, and selling footwear that won't let your feet in the day before you are ready. Plus, if you've ever had trouble fitting into that cute pair, SAS has fashionable designs and a range of sizes and widths to fit any foot. Right now, you can go online to sasfootwear.com. That's www.sasfootwear.com and enter the code happy hour at checkout for free shipping on your first order. Or check out their helpful store locator and pop into any of the hundreds of SAS locations across the country. Tell them the happy hour Jamie Ivy sent you and get $10 off your first purchase. Follow SAS Shoemakers on Instagram to see the newest styles from SAS where style feels good. You guys, last one. I also want to thank Wink. Wink makes it easy to discover great wine by shipping wines that are personalized just for you right to your door. So if I asked you to go into a store and pick out a wine that you love, but it has to be one that you hadn't had before, where would you start? For me, I just pick a label that I like, but that's where Wink comes into play. Just answer a few simple questions in Wink's palette profile quiz like, how do you take your coffee and how do you feel about blueberries? Then Wink sends you wines curated to your taste. The more wines you rate, the more personalized your monthly selections are. Then they send the wine straight to your door. It's the best day of your month, all starting at just $13 a bottle. Each month, there are new delicious wines like the insanely popular Summer Water Rosé. There's no membership fees. You can skip any month, cancel any time. Shipping is covered. And if you don't like a bottle, they'll replace it with one that you love. Discover great wine today. Go to trywink.com slash happy hour and you're going to get $20 off your first shipment. That's T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash happy hour for $20 off. Trywink.com slash happy hour. Guys, thank you for these sponsors. You can get some wine, some new shoes, and a bra all on the happy hour. Okay, now back to my conversation with Mo. You know, let's switch gears for just a second. Yeah, and sorry, we got deep. No, 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 this is, we're about to get deeper. Here we go. Um, but you talk about pornography in here. Yeah. And um, that is that is something that I have heard so much since releasing my book because I talk mm-hmm. about pornography. Yeah. It is what I have heard the most from women, hands down. It's yep. the secret DMs. It's the site. It's the email of I've never told anyone. Yep. It's all of the messages of, I struggled with this for years. No one knows. I found yeah. porn when I was seven and it created an addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had moms reach out to me and say, we've just discovered that our 12-year-old daughter has been looking at porn for the past yeah. four years. It is, it gives me chills and makes me want to cry of how silent this is mm-hmm. with women. Yep. And I'm here to say like, this has to stop. Yeah. You too, right? Here we go. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, girl, let's go. Cause this is where we, um, share so much in common. And let me just say too, I'm so proud of you Mm. for using the platform God's given you to exalt that brokenness, to speak of that, to to give it life and to point to the glory of of the cross as an active continued necessity that we cling to. Um, It feels to me like this special time right now where women are kind of rising up and saying, I, I'm struggling mm-hmm. with this too. Yeah. And it takes people being courageous for others to feel courage yeah. too, yeah. you know? And um, so I'm proud of you for speaking about that stuff, even well, though it's you too, so girl. Hard. I mean, it is hard. And I'm sure that people have asked you the same questions they've asked me of, you know, what does your husband think about this? Or was this hard to write? And, you know, for me, it is a matter. And I, I, I'm going to assume you're going to say the same thing. It's a matter of me saying, hey, I'm going to go first. Let's yeah. just get it all out on the table. Yeah. My husband's a pastor. I do ministry like you. Here, yeah. Here's where it is. Yeah. And for me, it was a matter of saying, hey, this is something that plagued me really early in my marriage and early of following Jesus. Yeah. And then here's an example. I thought it was put to death. This is not going to bother me anymore. I yeah. love Jesus. And then sin will creep back up. Yeah, and rear its head. And we got to know how to fight it. Yeah, There are so many women who struggle with pornography. Um, and so 
what is you, what do you say to them when the emails come, when the messages come? What is your what do you say to them? Um, usually I say we're, we're running this race together, sis. This is very real right now in our culture and it is very rampant. One of the, the stats when I was writing my book that was just almost nauseating, but almost this reality check too, was in 2016 alone, in one calendar year, we as a people consumed 4.6 billion hours of porn on one website in one year. 4.6 billion hours of porn. It's 17,000 complete lifetimes of porn in one year on, on one, one website. website. And there are hundreds of For thousands sure. of pornographic websites. One year, one website, we as a people group consumed 4.6 billion hours of porn. And how this was sobering to me and why I just wanted to say, hello, you know, is anybody seeing this? If we think that is all... Mm-hmm. I know where you're going, right? Males making up that statistic. That's We're absurd. Dumb. Pornography is affecting men. It's affecting women. It's affecting children. The average age of porn is exposure to porn is nine years old. It's affecting the church. It's affecting non-believers. It is rampant in our world right now. And those statistics are made up by many demographics, by both sexes, by people of all ages. And the fact that we clearly have aching, bleeding heart issues right now. And the church isn't the first to say, man, let us speak into this. Let us speak life to this. Let's get raw about this. Let's get open about that. It just, it, it dizzies me. I'm like, we have to go first. We have to be the first to stand up and say, man, this is something I've wrestled with too. This is very real. I struggled with really porn addiction, basically, from age eight to 18, a decade of my life consumed by this. Porn is very vicious in, in nature. It almost calls out to you. It's why seven-year-olds exposed are struggling at 12. That You feel a shame, then a curiosity, and then you go seek out more and more and more. And there's then images you can't get out of your mind. And there's thoughts that will still creep back in, you know, years later. And it's just it's just debilitating because really I feel like so much of what porn does is it takes this beautiful, pure, whole and wonderful gift that God's given us and it perverts it in the max capacity. And we seek it to, to fulfill our instant urges. And the most dangerous thing is that we then lose the humanity of sex and we lose humanity towards our brothers and sisters on the screen. We see people as body parts rather than image-bearing creations of God. And it fulfills our instant urge, our instant want, but it never satisfies. And so we come back for more. We seek out more. We end up seeking out even more perverse things because it's what not we previously You're done. saw yeah. wasn't satisfying. Need more than that. And we end up just down a rabbit mm -hmm. hole of brokenness. Mm -hmm. And I would say to any woman listening, you're not alone in this. This is something that is a massive struggle, a, a massive issue with so, so many women. And we've got to, to give it voice. We have got to open up. We've got to talk about it. We've got to seek counsel for it. We've got to bring it up into the light so that we can wrestle with it and so that we can overcome these struggles and reclaim sex for the mm -hmm. glory of God yeah. and reclaim our eyes and reclaim our brain wiring and reclaim you know, our heart and reclaim the humanity of the people around us yeah. and even our own hearts. Mm -hmm. And I think when you talk about like the church, we've got to say something. Mm -hmm. if, if we know, and we both know, and probably there are many smart people listening to this show, know the havoc, the what, Pornography can wreak havoc on their on their marriages, mm -hmm. on their brain, on their sexual stamina. I mean, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and there was a counselor talking about how he had, he was seeing a 19 year old boy who had been so inundated with porn for so long. Yeah. This is I don't know if this will make the cut, but he couldn't he couldn't perform with a real person. Yeah. Yep. It's brand, it's happening constantly. Yes. So if if this is if we can see how awful this is affecting us, yeah, we know that there's a savior and a hope. Yeah. There, nothing's too gone for Jesus. Exactly. And we know that we're evidence of it. You know, like 
the worst of sinners has been saved. And so yeah. there's hope for us. Well, then we should be the first saying, hey, this is terrible and awful and has wrecked parts of your world. There's hope. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to so consistently bring it to the foot of the cross Mm -hmm. and surrender it when it's in my own heart, my own life. I want to live in such authenticity around fighting this battle and breaking these chains so that I can then reach out to a hurting world and not feel silenced in shame because I'm still kind of wrestling with it behind closed doors. I really want freedom through Christ so that I can then reach out to a hurting and broken world that's consuming 4.6 billion hours in a year and say, hey, wake up, Mm -hmm. you know, let's rise up. Let's let me know freedom first so I can share freedom with the one who feels as bound and as plagued and as dark as they come. Because that freedom at the cross, that freedom that Christ offers from these sin struggles, from this shame, it is is far greater than any, any darkness that would loom Mm. or feel too overwhelming. And um, I don't know, it's just, it's also, I'm just kind of feisty and I just get annoyed too (laughs) in the fact that like a realization of how much a world that could really care less about us will pander to our sin nature and our wants and our lusts and all of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, They know exactly what they're doing. They know how it literally releases neurotransmitters in the mind that give us a, a rush that we want to come back for more. Like they a know drug. That, it's a drug. It's a drug. It's a dopamine hit. Uh-huh. And they know every click is more money yeah. for them. And so it's, I get, ah, yeah, I get fired up and angry at, at the fact that we're such sheep to a world that could care less about us, mm-hmm. our marriages, our purity, our children, any of it. The world will pander for the mm-hmm. for the money. Mm-hmm. And so there's a part of me too that like, let's just step away from the spiritual side and talk about the practical side right. of like, we are We're feeding the, the machine. I mean, We're yeah. feeding the machine. Yeah. There's, there's supply because uh-huh. there's demand. Exactly. And they keep us in this cycle and we are silent financial partners to the, the issue of sex trafficking, of human slavery. When we're clicking around pornographic sites, yep. you are a silent mm-hmm. financial partner to sex trafficking. That's right. And so there's just a part of me too that's like, oh no, no, oh, no, not on my I watch. Get, yeah, I get a righteous yeah. anger uh-huh. about that, and um, I just want to. It's like you just want to shake dry bones and mm-hmm. say, "Come back to life. Yeah. Come back to life. Mm-hmm. Look at this. Come on, rise up, rise up. Look at the cross. Set your eyes up. Set your eyes up and look at the freedom there is for you. The shame you don't have to live in." the freedom from this pandering world. We can live in this world, but not of it. And I'll just keep going for two right. hours. This will become the happy six the hours. Happy six hours with Mo. <laughs> okay, so you wrote this book for who? Mm. My first answer wanted to be for myself. I genuinely needed to get these words out of my bones. It was like, I genuinely needed the final one-two punch to the enemy of ever holding any of this over me. Uh Because let me just say right now and say to anyone listening, we're missing who Jesus really is. We are so often sitting in the muck and the mire of our sexual sin because we're missing who Jesus really is. Jesus is the one who sat at the well and drummed up every bit of sexual sin from the Samaritan woman right in front of her face. And in the face of her filth, he stayed. He stays at that well and he offers her living water that she wouldn't have to make this trek back and forth ever again. Jesus is the one who kneels down and (laughs) dilly dallies in the sand when they're wanting to stone the adulteress and says, if you have no sin, then cast the first stone and everyone leaves. And Jesus is the one who stands up to the adulteress and says, then I don't condemn you either. Now in response to my great love for you, go and sin no more. Jesus is the one, God is the one who uses Rahab, the prostitute in the lineage of Jesus Christ. God is the one whose first conversation with man is about sex. God cares so deeply about sex. There's such beautiful purpose in his design and there is such unrelenting power in his redemption of our sexual sin struggles. And we don't, we don't know that Jesus. We, we, we have been silenced or hurt or scorned or shamed by people who 
shake a finger or by a rule list of do's and don'ts or by a world that says you're much too messy and much mm-hmm. too broken. And man, my reason for writing this book is because I wanted people to know the truth of sex. I wanted people to know the truth of God's design and the truth of who Jesus really is in light of our sexual sin. Ugh. So I had to write it. I had to write it for myself because I needed to remind myself who Jesus is in light of our sexual sin. And I just wanted, honestly, to just throw the one-two punch at the enemy. Um, But I also wanted to write this to equip women of all ages, equip them with answers, first off, because I think a lot of the times we're silent. We don't know what to say. It seems taboo. It seems awkward because we don't know how to answer the questions. We don't even understand, you know, the core of our heart struggles with sexual topics. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to put a resource in people's hands to say, not only can you read this and understand the beautiful story God's writing in your life of redemption, of hope, of healing, but also so that you can know how to have these conversations with your children, with your girlfriends, with your sister, with your mom, with your grandparents. I mean, so we can know how to have real conversations and authenticity and vulnerability with one another that always come back to the truth of God's word and to like the true theological depth and understanding of sex as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I wrote it for myself. I wrote it for others as a narrative, but also as an equipment, as a tool, a resource for them. Um, hopefully, I, I hope ultimately it's a catalyst into conversations that um, the Holy Spirit can move in and you know speak yeah. truth in ways that I'll never yeah. know who or what details. Well, I think it's a book that you know when I read it, here I am, you know, almost forty, and it was so good for me to read to be reminded because I feel like not in a self righteous way, but I have I have struggled through some sexual sin in my life. Yeah. Um, and even dealt with stuff as a, in a married woman with my identity and all yeah. kinds of things. And it was so good for me to read. And then I thought to man, all of these girls who were in college who just are are dating and wanting to understand how do I have a healthy relationship? I was like, this is a great book for them as well. Yeah. So I feel like that this is a great book for any woman. We'll just say that. Thanks. Any Thanks. woman. I think it just so much, I don't even think I realized this when I was writing it, but I'm realizing more and more as I'm hearing feedback it's so much not just a book about sex. It is a book about the heart of who we are, mm-hmm. the heart of who God is, where things go left, and how He so beautifully redeems. Which you said you grew up in church. I did as mm-hmm. well. And this is, I, I don't cast blame on anybody for this, but I grew up thinking, you know, the worst things you could do when I grew up is have sex and drink alcohol. Mm-hmm. Those are like the two big sins, right? Yeah. And I just, I took care of those pretty early on. So I'm like, <laughs> what do I have? I have nothing to live for now. But I feel like too, like when you're talking about the heart of sex, like God created it. I think a lot of people, especially growing up in the church, God, please don't let this happen to my kids. Like I'm just praying that like we're raising them different, right? Yeah. Um, is not different than my parents. I'm just saying, I feel like the generation, i grown up in the 90s in church, it was like, don't have sex and don't drink alcohol. Right. But no one, I don't remember hearing about the heart. Right. Or like, why? Yeah. Or that, I mean, you read in in scripture and Jesus is like, actually, you've all done all of these things wrong because I look at the heart. And I didn't have that healthy view of sex. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I don't know whose fault it was. I just didn't get it. Yeah. And I didn't either. And I... You know, this I don't book, think our parents knew how to talk about this stuff either. I don't think they did because I don't think their I don't think parents their parents talked, talked to them, them either. Exactly. No, I think that we're this new kind of generation of like I've been reading ki- books to my kids about sex since they were like three. Yeah, like yep. this is all we're doing things different. Yes, yeah, yeah. My daughter's two, and we um, thoroughly talk about <laughs> in simple terms, For sure. but in celebrating who we are, how we're uh-huh. made. This is how mommy is. Yeah. This is how daddy. Is, you know, because we have a glass shower, and that child's just interested <laughs> in everything. So already. Yeah, I I hope our generation is approaching things differently because I feel like a lot of the time it's the it's the silence or the lack of conversation Mm -hmm. that actually leads to more of a struggle than a true like disobedience to conversation that has been had. You know what I mean? Right. I I I don't know where I've been trying to trace it back to where we kind of all went, missed the mark on this in conversation, but. 
I feel by and large that we as the church have honestly been so drowned out of the sexual conversation because the world has just claimed sex and, and cheapened it and worshiped it and twisted it and idolized it. And it's this screaming sexual debate in the world that in many ways the church has been drowned out of the conversation and like in this gasping breath of trying to get a whisper in, it's this rule list of this is right, this is wrong, this is sin, this is not, do this, don't do that. And it's like the how we feel like we can get, you know, at least some truth into the equation. But what happens is that that then becomes about behavior modification rather than heart transformation. And, and if we're going to be completely honest, we're, we're not people who are going to not do something because we've been told mm -hmm. not to, you know, we for so long have stood at the pulpit and shaken our frustrated fist at the world for our failing morality. But we've, it's like putting band-aids on bullet holes because we've forgotten to address the aching, bleeding needs of people's hearts. Why are we so inclined to sexual sin? What does God have to say about it? Why does it matter to be obedient to what he has to say about it? Who are we? And what does that mean in light of sexuality? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I feel like we're, the, the, I hope this book is not a call out of the church as much as it's a call up of the church, a call up of the body of believers of saying, do we understand that sex was God's invention? That he created it as a gift that his gifts are never meant to be burdensome or shameful or guilt-ridden or taboo, that he gave us this incredible gift and that, that our, our choices, our decisions are the things that have robbed it of its goodness, of, you know, twisted its, its holy capacity. And I, I don't understand why we as the church have stayed so silent in celebrating sex, mm. celebrating what sex is, celebrating the beauty of it in the right context and speaking very bluntly and honestly into the nature of our hearts and how our heart is going to want to twist that, yep. steal that, yep. change that, you know, do that differently. If we would be authentic and honest and vulnerable, we wouldn't, I think we're afraid to be, you know, offensive or irrelevant or out of touch, but our silence as the church is what's making us irrelevant and out of touch. We must speak to the heart of man. We must speak to the heart because, because it's always about heart transformation rather than just behavior modification. Our behavior is what comes out of a pure or an impure heart. God always cares first and foremost about the heart. It's always about relationship, about dependence on him and this walk with him. And if, if we're just saying to the young people, you know, don't have sex right. until you're married. Uh -huh. Well, guess what? Then we're becoming young people who are supposed to say, no, 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 no. I do. Yes, okay, yes, suddenly, yes, yes. Yeah. Suddenly this no. is okay. How do you turn that on? How am I suddenly supposed to flip a uh -huh. switch? So instead then we're experimenting and we're struggling in singleness and then we're carrying shame into the bedroom or we're saying no so much. Then sex is suddenly built up as this thing that will just suddenly complete us in marriage and be so amazing. And we're looking at the movie and the TVs about this is what sex is like. And well, it's guess not what, like honey? that. <laughs> sex is not like that. Not all the time, at least. No. And we end up. I mean, I talk about the honeymoon hardship in my book. Of suddenly, we're 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 women who are crying on our honeymoon mm -hmm. because sex is nothing like we thought it was yeah. like or we've carried in these false expectations, by the way, I should copyright that or something. <laughs> I did like that. Uh, that suddenly aren't fulfilled. And suddenly we are in the context in which sex can be so wonderfully celebrated and we are more bound than ever yeah. in confusion and mm -hmm. shame and guilt yeah. and all of these things. My sister-in-law told me the best quote prior to getting married. She said, before marriage, the enemy will do everything he can to drive you together. And after marriage, the enemy will do everything he can to drive you apart mm -hmm. because it's the exact opposite of God's intent yeah. and design for and fullness uh -huh. of what he yeah. made. I feel when you talk about like bringing in those expectations into the marriage and stuff, yeah. one thing that was really difficult for me is since I had been having sex since I was 16, I felt loved. I felt wanted. Right. I felt desired. I felt as though that's what made this person 
want me and love me yeah. was sex. Yeah. So then get married and, you know, Aaron, I have a great sex life. I'm sure my yes, parents girl. love when they hear me say that. <laughs> um, but I remember, and I, I have really come a long ways in this, but there are many years where, you, I mean, you have two kids, mm -hmm. right? There were many years where we had all these little kids and sex is harder. Yeah. You've got kids, you've got milk coming out your boobs. You, mm -hmm. you, you've you got yeah, granny panties. Moments. I mean, all the things. And I remember I struggled with, does Aaron still love me? Mm -hmm. Because we're not having sex as much. Yep. Yeah. In those seasons. Yeah. And, you know, I would tell him that and he'd be like, that's so dumb. I mean, not yeah. in, in a nice way, but you know, he was just like, how, why would that mean I love you? Like, I wouldn't, we we're just in a hard time. Yeah. But that was an identity cry. It was an identity yep. thing for me is that I was not resting in first my identity with the Lord. Right. And second, my identity with my husband was not based on if we were having sex because we've got four kids under six. Right. Um, and so that was something that I brought in. Yeah. From having a false view of what sex was. Right. Yeah. And that, I feel like we can literally trace that all the way back to Adam and Eve mm, because- mm -hmm. The first, I mentioned before, the first conversation God ever had with man involved sex. And it also involved man's inherent worth and value. So, so if we look at scripture, man's value and sex were always braided together and intertwined. God's first conversation with man was go forth, be fruitful, multiply. And he has designated man as the pinnacle of his work, of of made in his image to rule over, to have dominion over, deeply loved by God, fashioned by God, formed by God. And then he instructs now, be fruitful, be productive, be, you know, contributing agents in this world and go forth and multiply, delight in this gift I've given you. And so our value and our sexuality have always been married we very quickly, when we enter into sexual sin, we unwind the two, we rip them apart. And that is why you always see, I would literally say always see sexual sin root around seeking affirmation mm -hmm. or value or worth or love. Because, because a 16 year old is not out a girl because she wants to have sex. Right. She wants to be loved. She wants to be loved. She wants to be affirmed. She wants to be loved. She wants but to we be don't loved. need a partner to assign us value. We need our soul reawakened uh -huh. to our worth in God's yeah. eyes. But sexual sin always becomes a seeking agent for love or affirmation mm -hmm. or... It makes me even like one of like, I'm, I so like want my kids to know that they're loved by their mm -hmm. parents. I think it's even more than that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what if Aaron and I die? Yeah. Yep. You know, I mean... I hope we don't. We, right. We, before we this year, our kids get, but you know what I mean? Like, but I, now I'm thinking like, man, I want my kids so much to understand how loved they are by God. Yeah, by God. Because that is the only love that we'll ever sustain. Our parents will fail us. Everybody will. My dad put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger. And do you want to know what my greatest wrestling match came in my heart? How was his love for me not enough? Mm. How was my love for him not enough to make for him, him to do put that. down that gun? The love of others will always fall short because we're human. We're human. The love of our husbands will never fully satisfy Can't. every need we have. The love of our parents won't. Even the love from our children. God calls us to love him with all of our heart. We, Here we are again. Yeah, yep. Let's come full circle. So that we are so full and complete by the overwhelming never ending reckless love. I love God. that song um, so much. That the love of our husband is the cherry on top yeah. of a Sunday. The love of our children are like the sprinkles on top of us. And let's just make this yeah, like full here we go. picture. But that we are so satisfied and complete in the, the, the inherent knit into us, always intended cross-taking love of God, that the love of man, the affirmation of man is only a beautiful bonus and, and can become something that we, lay our lives down for and give of ourselves and learn and grow and fail and succeed, but it never changes our inherent understanding of mm -hmm. whose we are yeah. and, and that inherent love. So I'm right there with you. How on earth do I teach my child yeah. that? Yeah. 
Um, that's going to be a tricky one, but that is our greatest mission. I think yeah. as parents, as mothers, is that they know that we're not the end all mm-hmm. be all, but, but God is. You can write that next book. Yeah, maybe I should just start. <laughs> I need to come to this. <laughs> you need to come this sit in the little little tiny house and get inspiration. Yes. Um, Mo, I, I'm so grateful for you writing this book. I'm, I'm grateful for your bravery. Um, I'm grateful for your willingness to be vulnerable uh, because we all benefit from it. Yeah. You say you wrote this book for you to be that final punch to the devil. And I love it. Like we're, I love that. I love that you did this for all of us as well. So yeah. thank you so much. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This has been you. a joy. And I know that this, our conversation between two women talking about sex and pornography and the redemption that Jesus offers us all is going to really set some women free. So thank I you. So. You guys go get our book. Go follow her on Instagram. Woohoo. Thank you guys. Guys, don't forget about Third Love. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash Jamie to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. Guys, I told you that this girl was on fire, on fire. I think that we could have talked for hours upon hours about this subject. My prayer and hope for you today is that your heart was challenged no matter what season you are in. I know you're wondering what her three favorite things were and what she's reading. I had to cut them out of the show for timing because I told you we talked and talked and talked. Here they are. Koi sunglasses, Uber, and Instagram stories. Speaking of Instagram stories, go follow Mo on Instagram. She has great Instagram stories where she basically just preaches. It's phenomenal. She's trying to read more, but let me remind you that she has two babies, so that's hard. She's doing the devotional by Sean Boltz called Exploring the Prophetic. Today's show was edited by Chris with Podshaper, which if you have a podcast and you need an editor, go hit up Chris and tell him Jamie sent you. The music was developed for the show by Matt Graham. Next week, my guest is Lindsay Kramer. And I'm certain that some of you know who she is because she has over 70,000 followers on Instagram. And I'm certain that some of you are over there following her. I adore this lady and she is so down to earth and kind and oozes love for her people. Her and her hubby Jason run Yonder Way Farm, and we talk all about farm life and what led a young couple to just pick up and start a farm. It's a super fun conversation. Guys, enjoy your week. Share the show with a girlfriend. I hope May is treating you really well. Have a happy hour with a friend, and I will see you back here next week with my friend, Lindsay Kramer. <laughs>